Today is Thanksgiving Sunday. We are fastly approaching Thursday, which is a glorious day where we get to celebrate and break bread with family and friends. My sister and brother-in-law are coming into town. Uh, my daughter Olivia is coming back from university. Friends are already starting to join, as you heard. Pastor Ray and Tara are here. And Zion's waving over there, too. Super excited they're here. Uh, Pastor Ray, one of my best friends and spiritual sons, so proud of what God has been doing in his life. And uh, he'll be here for actually the next couple months um, as he's transitioning into new places of ministry. So I'm super excited for him. We'll get to see his face and hug on him a little bit. But today is a different kind of a Sunday. I've been, in fact, a couple people have told me the last series of messages that I've been given for maybe the last actually couple months have been pretty beefy. You know, someone, Pastor Steve said, yeah. <laughs> um, today's going to be a little bit different because the heart of God today, and as you can, as Gina said about themes, is about raising a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving. And so we're going to actually have some testimonies today, and uh, we're going to get a little bit in the Word. Now, if you open your app, my outline is there. I cannot promise you that I'm going to fill every blank, that I'm going to walk through this, because I do, the importance is on the testimony. We're going to have some testimonies. Um, and then we're going to all take communion together to close the service. So that's kind of where we're headed, if you're wondering. But there is the first point I want to make to you today. There is power in our testimony. There is power in the testimony of Jesus that is emanating from our lives and our lips. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 and 11, it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. You know, I've taught on this verse many times throughout the years to you in this congregation, and I've talked about when we release our testimony, people get saved. People get saved. They hear what God is doing. They hear about the blood of the Lamb. They hear about what God has done in our lives, and they get saved. We know that as the testimony is released, there is power that is released because what God will do for one, he will do for another. So as you release your testimony, if you were like, oh, my marriage was breaking apart and God stepped in, someone else whose marriage is breaking apart is like, yeah, I want that. And power is released, a grace is released for others to step in. The kingdom advances when the testimony is released. Authority is released as testimony is released. But as I was praying about it this week, I heard the Holy Spirit say, you're missing one, Regan. You're missing one. Thanksgiving is released as the testimony is released. Why? Because you remember what God has done for you and your heart swells yes. with gratitude. So I, with that kind of as the framework of what we're talking about, I have asked a few people in advance to come forward and I'll call you up one by one to give a brief testimony. And my whole purpose of doing that is for you to celebrate the goodness of God but also for you to sit back and think, if they did it, if God did it for them, he can do it for me. Also to think that, hey, I have my own testimony. And allow us to just think and remember what God has done in our own life. I'm going to start, many of these testimonies we've released throughout the year. Some of them we have not. So I'm just going to go ahead and start at the beginning. I'm going to ask Tanya to come on up here. And uh, she's going to give a real quick testimony 
of a teacher that she works with, and you guys have heard my dad even talk about it, but just briefly tell us the story so we can celebrate the goodness of God. So three years ago, God moved me to a different school district. Um, I met a teacher who um, uh, she couldn't have babies. Um, and so I approached her and I said, um, after building relationship with her, I said, hey, my father-in-law, he has this gifting that God has given him. He will pray for women and they will conceive. And I said, I would love to be able to take you to, I will set an appointment and take you myself and for him to pray for you. And she said, no. And um, she said, I'm too angry with God. And I, I'm, I don't want the prayer right now. I'm just angry. And um, I said, okay. I respect that. I said, but the offer is there for you. If you ever want to, I will be glad. So in the meantime, knowing that, I began to pray for her, for her heart. I knew that beyond more than the the conception that was important, but more than that, her heart was really heartened towards God, and she wanted nothing to do with God at that time. So I began to pray for her and just prayed, and, and little by little planted some seeds. I will send her a worship song when I felt like God was saying, just send her her way, and she will just really receive it and just say thank you. And so little by little, and so I will go back to her, hey, the offer is still there if you will, if you will like. She's like, okay, thank you. And so I just kept praying, praying. Two years passed. And finally, one day she came to me. She said, I'm ready to take the offer. I, I want the prayer. And so I, I just said, absolutely. So I set up an appointment with Dennis. And after work, we walked over, uh, went over to Bethel West and met him there. And after we left, I just felt God, God spoke to me, not audibly, but just to my heart. And I just sensed God saying, by this time next year, she's going to have a baby boy. And so I saved that in my heart, but I just kept praying. I'm like, okay, God, I, I, you know, we doubt ourselves sometimes. And I just feel like, God, I hope this is not me wishful thinking, but this is you because I just want to see this in her life. And so, um, you know, that time passed and um, came back from summer break and she was waiting for me with this cupcake in her hand. And I'm like, oh, thank you. And she said, no, 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 read the note. And she was so excited. She was beaming. And so when I read the note, she said, uh, baby, um, I'm not going to say her last name, but baby, so-and-so is, it's coming. Um, and she gave the date. And when she, when I read her date, it was exactly what I felt God was speaking to me, that date. And so she said, and not just that, she said, I just want you to know that I am so in love with God because he's restored my heart, she said. And so um, she's like, I could truly believe that he does want what's best for me and what's good for me. She said, this baby, she said, did not come earlier. She said, now I understand is because God wanted to heal my heart. And it was her who came to the realization that God not just wanted to bless her with a baby, but he also wanted to restore her relationship. So fast forward this summer, I left that district and she sent me this text and she said, I, I hope it's not selfish of me to believe that God sent you here just for me, which I got the opportunity to reply, I know God sent me here just for you. So not just so you can have your baby boy, but because God loves you so much that he wanted to restore his relationship with you. So now she's attending a church in Visalia with her family, she's serving God, and she has her baby boy. Come on! Isn't God good? Bruce Williams, will you come up? What a story of breakthrough and the goodness of God. That's what this morning is all about. Many of you may not know Bruce, but Bruce and Becky, you've been attending off and on for what, a couple years now. And uh, God has just been doing such a work in this man's life that you have to hear his story. Just go ahead and take a few minutes and let us know your story. Okay. Good morning. Um, so Becky's always been going to church and, um, I've always believed in God. I grew up believing in God my whole life. I thought that's where it stopped, you know, um, there's, there's more to it than that. Um, I found that out. Um, so me and Becky, um, got married about four years ago, um, was, Totally in love. We thought that's what it, you know, we wanted to be together, live the good life. We, 
We actually got married and it took a nosedive. Um, it's tougher than you think, you know, blended families and stuff like that. Um, that took a nosedive. I took a nosedive as well. She's a lot stronger than I am. Um, started doing some drugs, started doing all the bad stuff. Come to church occasionally, you know, just to see. It's hard to find a church that the family that we have here. You know, it, it's really tough. I, I've been through churches. I've been to a bunch, but there's not a church out there that touches me the way this church touches me. So, um, so I, I kept going. I went to a couple here. I, I stopped going, and I told Becky, because Becky would always encourage me to go, that I go, this has to be something I want to do from my heart. This is my relationship with God. You have your relationship with him, and I have mine. So things kind of fell down. We were going to get a divorce. Um, crappy word. Uh, but, um, you know, um, I broke. One day I, I broke. Um, I was at home one day, and I always listen to worship music. And me and Becky were talking about signing the papers. Becky would tell me about signing the papers. She was a go for the divorce. I was a no. I didn't believe in it, you know. Um, so uh, I kept praying about it. I kept pushing it off. I go, there's something in me, you know. I, pr I, pray, to my, I pray to God. Not as close as I am with him today. Um, I prayed to him. Um, it just wasn't working. Becky thought it was maybe a cover-up. And I can see where she was coming from. But when I broke, I got on my hands and knees, listened to the song Closer from Brandon Lake. I got on my hands and knees that night and cried straight to God with my hands up high and said, show me what you need me to do. I love you, you know. I, I was broken. I was broken, and I felt him that night. I I heard him say, "You're okay." <laughs> Unforgettable feeling. I can't even describe. It's a personal thing you have to have amongst yourself with him. Um, it was tough. I didn't know how to take it. You know, I kept talking to Becky. I said, Becky, I think it's, um, it's time that I need to come to church. I want to come now. Now I want to come. This is me. I want to come. Like I said, it's always been plan he's always been planted in my heart. But now it's time for me to move. Yes, sir. It's time for me to move. So I started coming to church. That guy flipped my life around. Drugs that I did never stopped right the instant that I broke. I broke, those stopped. I, my, my, I marriage to my wife. <laughs> it's stronger than it's ever been. We pray together. We do everything together. And what I love is that our love that we bring into that house brings love into our kids as well. Yes, sir. And I thank them. I thank him every day. I try to get as close as I can to him as possible. I don't think there's ever a stop to it. I think it's just all about going forward with him and feeling that love. Because you think you're at that highest point. You think you felt everything with love. And God just hit you with that like, no, here's a little more of it. And it's, it's amazing. And I give him thanks every single day. Wow. Isn't God good? Yeah.
Are you ready for more? Yes. Doris, would you come? Doris Wright. This is a, this is a fresh one from this week. But I was so moved. Our house fire group was so moved at this testimony. And uh, come on and step up here. Doris, tell us a little bit about what God did for you guys. Well, we have a son who's 43 years old. And at House Fire Group, I said that it's been 35 years, but we're not that old. It's only, it's only been 25. So, whew, thank you, Lord. But um, we raised this boy to serve the Lord. He was taken to the house of the Lord. He accepted the Lord at a very young age. He was called to the ministry and filled with the Holy Spirit. And when he was about 18 years old, he joined the army and he walked away from the Lord. I mean, walked away from the Lord. It was horrible. His life has been full of pitfalls. Some he stumbled into, some he got pushed into, and some he just jumped in. And if there's one word that could describe his life, it would be tragic. It, it's just been a mother's nightmare, mother's and father's nightmare. But Kevin and I held on to what we knew God had promised us, that if we raise our children in the house of the Lord, that he'll be faithful to us, and he'll, he'll keep them, and he'll bring them back. And the Lord has pursued our son. Well, we got a text, I don't even know what day it was, Tuesday or Wednesday, and he was telling me that he had had a dream, and it was a horrible dream, and, and I can't even, he doesn't even want to tell me all of it, but um, in this dream, he saw things that were horrid. And then he, he just went on to say how he sees the world, you know, coming in things of the Lord, and how things are shaping up. And then this last sentence that he wrote, but if it leaves your mind, I have asked Jesus to forgive and to accept me into his kingdom. Come on. Anybody else out there praying for a son, a daughter? It's been a while. What God does for one, he'll do for another. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing here in the lives of people at Bethel. God is constantly healing people as well here in this assembly. When we pause for our ministry time and we lay hands on each other, we know that the scripture says, these signs will follow them that believe. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. And God has healed so many people right here in this church. I could have grabbed a bunch of testimonies, but Janie, would you come forward? And uh, she's going to let you in on a little healing testimony um, that even speaks to my wife. My wife has been battling just slap tear and, and some shoulder injuries. I know even Bill Robertson has some shoulder stuff. Maybe you have some shoulder stuff. This is a testimony that will build your faith right here. So what did God do? Well, <laughs> this is about my husband, Alvin. And um, he's a farmer and he does all our yard work and everything. And uh, one day he was... Another day, he was going to um, trim our palm trees in the backyard. And all you ladies with husbands who, when you see your husband with a, a ladder and a pole saw, you know to start praying a little harder, right? <laughs> so anyway, he um, was cutting this big pod. It's probably about 40 pounds or so. And it, when it fell, it grabbed his saw and really wrenched his shoulder really bad. And... He felt pain, you know, right away, but, and then the next day was just excruciating. So we went to the doctor right away, and they did x-ray. It was not broken, so they ordered a MRI, because all he could, he could kind of hold it like this was the only way he could get a little bit of um, comfort. comfort. And um, so we did, he did the MRI, and then he went back to see 
the um, the doctor, and he was like, Alvin. But in, in between that, we had been to the our house fire group, and uh, prayed for healing for Alvin, and no pain. So when we went to the doctor, he's like, "Yes, you have a slap tear," and he's like, "And he's like, aren't you in like?" writhing in pain right now and he's like no <laughs> he is like uh I've been healed I, our house fire group pay, prayed for me and I and I said what do you think doctor and he goes I can't explain it it's um, it's a miracle yeah. so he agreed the doctor agreed Woo! I love it when the doctor agrees hey I don't know what happened here but we do, don't we? Anyone else with physical pain here in your body? Come on. God is here to heal and restore. I want to give you one last testimony that we vaguely released. Um, Andrew Sines, was, I was going to call him up here to give this again because um, there was more to the testimony. Um, but he had to go to a work-related thing. So he just wrote me a little email that I want to read to you now. But anybody here need a financial breakthrough? Here is your testimony. Andrew said, my testimony today is about having a large debt paid off. What I realized through this blessing is that sometimes we have to be willing to give up something to receive the blessings God has for us. Sometimes we have to be flexible, willing to move, or even experience some discomfort to walk in God's comfort. In my walk with the Lord, I've been told twice to sell everything and go where God calls me to go. When I moved to Arizona, I gained a profit from selling my house. And with some of this profit, I felt led by the Lord to sow into the debt of others. So I gave $750 to each of my siblings and my parents to pay their own debts. I paid $750 to the ministry of another prophet. I also felt led to sow into a friend's wedding, another $750. I've sowed into multiple, multiple ministries over the years, and most importantly, I've always tithed to my local church. I believe that my obedience to the Lord at that time, along with many other things, is key to my current financial breakthrough. How many of you realize that small keys open big doors? You know, and so sometimes we're going to be like, oh, my offering, my tithe, whatever. You don't realize those small keys are going to open up and set you up for God's breakthrough. In 2017, I felt led to take my current job. He's a chiropractor working in Hanford. I didn't want to leave my comfortable private practice, but taking this job opportunity set me up so that I could make payments on my school debt and even receive maybe debt forgiveness if I paid consistently for 10 years. In 2019, I felt strongly encouraged by David Kendrick, who attends the church, that God was going to pay off my debt. He even gave me $100 to sow with the belief that God was going to make it happen. After so many years had passed not seeing breakthrough, David's words and testimony in his own financial breakthroughs were very encouraging. So here he is being encouraged by someone else's testimony. It wasn't until I attended a school of the prophets conference at Bethel Reading this past August that I came to a place of being refreshed, restored, and reestablished in my service to the Lord. I told him I would no longer be afraid and would use my gifting for others as much as I could. This brought on a huge amount of attack by the enemy, but also brought major breakthrough by the Lord. One week later, at the end of August, I received a check in the mail from the Department of Education as a reimbursement for overpayment. When I went to my loan holder's website, it said my loan balance was now zero. I also received a letter from the Federal Department of Education that the current administration had released me from all my debt in June of 2022, hence the check for reimbursement. God is so good, nothing is impossible. Kathy and I are more than grateful to God for the release of this debt. We are more than thankful this Thanksgiving. And for those of you wondering how much debt it was, it was over half a million dollars that all of a sudden went to zero in an instant. 
I believe that with interest and all the things that had accrued through that big student loan and he hadn't been able to make payments on it, that it was approaching, if not over, even a million dollars in interest. So it was crazy. And it's been, since I've known Andrew, he's one of my best friends, it's just been this albatross, this weight that has hung on him, saying, oh, I make payments to it and it's never going to get there and God has promised, but I don't know what to do. And in an instant, he was set free from financial debt. Amen? Amen. Isn't God good? So today you've heard about God restoring families and marriages. Today you've heard about sons and daughters returning. Today you've heard about God healing the broken places of our bodies. Today you've heard about a God who will step into our debts and cancel them and give us abundant blessing. God will do it for you because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is not a respecter of persons. God is amazing, and we have much to be thankful for. Number two in your notes, there's power in our remembrance. When we remember, sometimes in the midst of our storms and our trials, we forget the God of the breakthrough. We may even cry out, oh God, help me. Oh God, save me. But we need to remember who he is. We need to remember what he has done. In Psalm 77, verse one, it says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me when I was in distress. I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out, untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated. My spirit grew faint. Can anyone relate to that? Where you're just in this season of struggle and you're just crying out to God. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs at the night. So he's going back and doing all the things he knows how to do. Singing the songs, reading the right things, trying to step in. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject me forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? So all of these, will God come through? Verse 10, then I thought, to this will I appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works. I will meditate on your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. Here we see David in distress, crying out to God, almost in this place, this pity party, this place of discouragement. Oh, and he's even doing the right things. Oh God, where are you? How long? And some of you here today have been asking those same questions. How long, God? But then he said, I will remember your works. Remembering ruins your pity party. We can be like, oh, how long? Oh, this is so horrible. But when you begin to remember what God has done, something swells in you. Faith arises, hope arises. And you're like, if God did it then, he will do it now. I remember who God is. I get my eyes off of the problem and onto the problem solver. And it ruins your pity party. Secondly, when you remember, it keeps you from backsliding. You know, sometimes we can be under such a weight that we're just like, ah, it's not worth it. Ah, it's like God isn't working for me. I want to tell you we follow God not because he works, but because he is true. Let every man be a liar. God is true. And when we remember what God has done, it keeps us from falling away. In Psalm 106, verse 7, we see it in 
the lives of the Israelites. Our ancestors in Egypt were not impressed with the Lord's miraculous deeds. They soon forgot his many acts of kindness to them. Instead, they rebelled against him at the Red Sea. Verse 21, they forgot God, their Savior, who had done such great things in Egypt, such wonderful things in the land of Ham, such awesome deeds at the Red Sea. So he declared he would destroy them, but Moses' chosen one stepped between the Lord and the people. He begged him to turn from his anger and not destroy them. The people refused to enter the pleasant land, for they wouldn't believe his promise to care for them. Instead, they grumbled in their tents and refused to obey the Lord. This passage is disturbing. We see a progression that ends in disobedience and ends in a place of not taking hold of all that God has for us. They were not impressed with God. They forgot who he was and what he had done in the past. And so their hearts turned cold. I want to challenge you this morning to remember the testimony of Jesus in your life. To remember the times he healed you. To remember the times he came through for you. To remember the times of intimacy with God. To remember the times you burned for him. To remember the times he saved your friend. To remember the times he saved your son. To remember the times he healed your body. To remember the times he broke through in your finances. And let your heart, as you remember begin to swell in gratitude and thanksgiving because instead of despair, you will have hope. Your hope will be in the Lord. When you came in today, Tanya being a teacher, this was all her idea. She's like, let's order pens for everyone and give them a piece of paper. And so we gave you, you probably came in like, why is there a pen and a pumpkin on my chair? It's because I'm married to a teacher. (laughs) We wanted to pause just for two minutes in the middle of our service for you to take a moment to quiet yourself. It's going to be absolutely quiet in here. And I want you to think about maybe some things you're even going on in your life right now. But I want that to cause you to access the testimony of Jesus in your life. I want you to write down on a piece of paper just a couple times where God has broken through. So Holy Spirit, I know we can access many things, but there are a few significant moments that are going to breathe life into us today. We want to remember what you've done. I want you to take that pen and that little pumpkin, and I want you to write on there just a couple things that the Holy Spirit is now bringing to your mind of the times that he protected you, of the times that he stepped in and provided for you, of the time that when he healed your body, of a time that when he, I just want you to write down, I'm thankful God for, and maybe you don't have to write down the whole thing, just a few words that remind you of that testimony. We're just going to pause just for two minutes. If you don't have a pen or paper, you can open up your cell phone notes. But everybody write down, Holy Spirit, remind us of your faithfulness, your goodness, your breakthrough, your miracles. If you're struggling to come up with something, just close your eyes and say, Holy Spirit, remind me. Remind me of your breakthroughs. One more minute.
wow, you came to church and didn't know you'd have homework and have to actually write some things down. You know, when Israel finally got their breakthrough, went across the Jordan and went into their promised land, God commanded Joshua to have them set up 12 stones from where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan and carry them out and pile them up where you camp tonight. Remembrance stones. So that the generations could remember not only the struggle, but the breakthrough. They could remember where they came from, but they could remember in the fingerprints of God and how he led them into the promise. I want to tell you this morning as we are closing our service, and like I said, in a minute we're going to approach the communion table. But this is the table of remembrance. That's what it's called. And when you remember what God has done for you in your life, your heart should swell with gratitude and thanksgiving. I want to show you really quickly from scripture. I'm going to read you just a couple scriptures, but I want to show you how this table of remembrance is so tied to thanksgiving. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 32 says, For I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to, what was that? Remember me. In the same way he took the wine after supper saying, this is my cup. The new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to, remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread and drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring we see this word honor, gratitude, thanksgiving. Without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But examine yourselves. Communion is about remembering. And remembering, and this table of remembrance, is tied to thanksgiving. In Matthew 26, Verse 26, it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, this is my body of, co of the covenant, or this is the blood of my covenant, sorry, which is poured out. For many in the forgiveness of sins. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, talking about the table, Lord. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? He actually calls it the cup of thanksgiving. Why? Because when you remember what he's done, the response should be thanksgiving. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three twenty four. 24. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks. Did you know this word thanks? I think I put it on the screen. Maybe not. No. It's eucharisto, where we get the word Eucharist. This word thanks, when he had given thanks, is eucharisto in Greek, meaning Eucharist. You can't find the word Eucharist in the Bible, but the term Eucharist is a term that we don't use so much in our denomination. But many of you who have Catholic backgrounds have heard the word Eucharist when we come 
to the table of the Lord. It was a term used in the early church by the fathers Ignatius of Antioch, Justin Martyr used it. But it's, this term Eucharist actually means thanks. So when we approach the table of the Lord, it's all about remembering, producing in us a spirit of thanksgiving. That we remember, Jesus, what you have done, and my heart swells with thanksgiving. And the people who don't approach this table in the right way, unworthily forgetting what Jesus has done for them, there is no thanksgiving at all. It's just rote. It's just duty. It's just something to do. It's just like I'm getting hungry. Can we get the snacks out, please? I'm just telling you there's no thanksgiving. This is a table of thanksgiving. When we approach it, we are to remember what he's done for us. Really quickly in your notes, what did he do? He laid down his life for us. He demonstrated the greatest act of love. He reconciled us to God. He justified us. He died for our sins. He canceled our sin debt. He rendered the devil powerless. He redeemed us. It should have been you. The Bible says the wages of sin is death and all of us have sinned and gone astray. But because of what Jesus has done on the cross, he has established a new covenant with God where we are made right, where we can come into relationship with him, where we can come into his presence, where we can experience his glory, his power, his might, where our hearts in the midst of all of the chaos of the world can swell with hope and thanksgiving as we remember what he's done for us. That's the heart of thanksgiving. I want to show you a quick video and then while the video is playing, I'm going to ask all of the ushers who have been selected to come forward as we get ready to take communion together. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Today, we are reminded of the sacrifice of our Savior. His body broken, his blood spilled, the weight of our sin crushing his shoulders. Today, we confess our unrighteousness. We lay down our arrogance. We surrender in obedience at the foot of the cross. Today, we remember. Take together, once you've received the elements, I'm going to ask that you just bow your head and remember all that Jesus has done for you. This is a time of remembrance. You'll know you've spent the adequate time remembering when your heart begins to be filled with thanksgiving. Remember what he did on the cross. Remember what he has done for you in the past. Remember what he is doing currently in your life. Bow your heads and spend a few moments. The Bible also says for us to examine ourselves I'm going to ask someone to come and get on the keys really quickly. 
The Bible tells us to examine ourselves. Don't approach the table of the Lord unworthily. We want to remember, but we also want to make things right. If you have something, an offense, a struggle, a grudge, a hurt, the Bible says to make that right before you approach the table of the Lord. Ask for forgiveness. Lay down your burdens. Some of you are going to be tempted just to pass the elements by, but I'm here to tell you this is your moment as you examine yourself with the help of the Holy Spirit. If you are struggling in your walk with God, if you have made bad choices, if you've given over to sin, just be like, God, I confess it. I don't make excuses, I confess it. I've been selfish, I've made wrong choices. And I lay it at your feet today, knowing that your word says, if I confess my sins, you are faithful and just and right. And you will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in this moment, bow your heads and remember what he's done for you. Ask for forgiveness if you need to. Access the testimony of Jesus in your life, what he's done for you on the cross, what he's done for you in your life, and approach the table of the Lord with thanksgiving today. Remember, remember his testimony. Remember your testimony. Let Thanksgiving arise. God, we are thankful to you that you sent your one and only son to die on a cross in our place. That whosoever would believe in you and put their trust in you, repent and turn from their wicked ways would be guaranteed of forgiveness and eternal life. We thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask everyone in here to stand as we take communion today. We're going to be present with the Lord at the table of thanksgiving. I want everyone in here to say thank you, Jesus, for the bread. Thank you, Jesus, for the cup. Father, right now I hold up the bread that speaks of your broken body, the broken body of your son, Jesus, who was broken so that we could be whole. In fact, your scripture says that by his stripes we are healed. We have heard the testimony of Jesus through this congregation today. Speak of your healing power, your breakthrough power, you have purchased breakthrough for us in the finished work of the cross. And holding this bread, we remember what you've done. And we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. I bless the bread in Jesus' name. Can we take it together? Can we hold up the cup of thanksgiving? The cup of thanksgiving. We're thankful for the blood of Jesus. Why? Because without the shedding of his blood, there's no redemption of sin. We are not right with God. We can't freely come into his presence. We are destined for 
eternal separation from God. We are destined for hell without the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. This is a cup of thanksgiving because I don't care what you've done and how bad you've done it. The blood is more powerful than any sin you've ever committed. This is the cup of thanksgiving. God, we hold this up. We remember what your son has done for us on the cross. His blood poured out so that we could step into the new covenant, a new covenant of life, freedom, wholeness, guaranteed eternal life. We thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Can we take it together? I want to stop in this moment, and I want you to audibly thank Jesus for just a few minutes. Would you lift your hands and just thank Jesus for what he has done? This is Thanksgiving week. Express your thanksgiving to the one who has saved your life, for the one who has healed you, for the one who has broken down every wall, to the one who has uh, stepped in with breakthrough in your finances, in your health, in your marriage, in your relationships, the one who loves you more than any other. We thank you. We thank you, Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you, author and finisher of our faith. We thank you, O champion, our great shepherd who leads us and guides us and protects us. Oh, Lord, we thank you for what you've done, for giving us eternal life, for dying in our place, for being resurrected and promising to resurrect us to new life. We thank you, Jesus. Jesus, our hearts are swelling with thanksgiving, remembering your goodness, your faithfulness to us, O oh God. We say thank you, O oh God. Now, fathers, we gather around our tables with our friends and family this week for thanksgiving. We remember what you have done, and we can love because you first loved us. Father, let your peace, let your anointing, let your blessing be upon every household, every family as they gather around to break bread. For those who are missing loved ones at this time or family members at this time, be near to them, Lord God. Let them know your love. I thank you for your resurrection power that we will be reunited once again with those who have gone on before us. We are thankful for that. And for those who are gathering together this week, God, let your love be in the midst of us. Your presence be in the midst of us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your testimony. And we overcome the adversary by the blood of the lamb and the power of our testimony. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done. In Jesus' name, I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Happy Thanksgiving, friends. You would help us by passing your cups to the edges of the aisles and picking up your seats and helping us put them away. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining with us today. If this message impacted you, remember to share it online through Facebook to Larry Bethel Church or YouTube to Larry Bethel TV. If you want to view any previous messages, you can find them on YouTube as well. If you need prayer or want to reach out to a pastor, you can connect with us on the church app under Connect. Isn't our church amazing? I just love Bethel and I'm so glad you came to church to be with us today. Have a great day.